So now let's build an actual classifier. So let's print the schema again. Let's preview it. Uh, so this will be uh, the data that we'll use for our random forest classifier. Again, random forest is just an ensemble of uh, decision trees. So let's initialize this. It's a quick overview. The key functions that we'll be using will be the transformers and estimators. All right. So here's where we specify uh, and we basically prepare our machine learning pipeline. So we want to make sure that we uh, index our all input data um, and, uh, and then we do a vector assembler. So basically we assemble all the different features and they're all labeled. Uh, the output column of this uh, assembler is uh, our, our basically features. Um, so um, the next one is uh, we specify, I'll make sure I run this. Um, the next one over here is we specify the random forest classifier. Um, this is a label indicates the, the, the label output, uh, basically yes or no for, for the violations. And again, you can see the, uh, uh, we specify this over here as the input column and the output column being the label. We fit that with the uh, transform data. Uh, and um, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we also uh, specify the label converter. So once we do the training, we can look back and have a um, you know and have a you know human understandable uh, tables that uh, specify uh, what this data actually means. And finally, of course, we specify the pipeline and all the different stages over here uh, with the random forest classifier, and then again the label converter, so we can actually make sense of this data. The next step, of course, is to split um, our data into both uh, training and test data. Um, and, uh, and the common split is 80-20% of some random seed. So we randomly um, uh, take this data and we split it 80-20%. Let's cache it. Uh, and um, we can quickly print the schema over here. So again, this is the trained data that we have. As you can see, this is exactly the same data. It's just now it's just the 80% of the overall data set. Um, and, uh, and this is the training data that will be used to train our model. So again, this, this looks exactly the same what you've seen previously, um, but just a quick preview. And now we can use the fit function over here on our uh, train data set to actually create the model. All right, so now we have the model. We can uh, score our test data set. Now we're gonna use the 20% of the data that the model has never seen to actually see how the model performs. All right, this is a little bit uh, too crowded, so let's look at some um, other outputs over here. Oh, this is much better, uh, far less crowded. Um, as you can see, this is a quick overview of just you know top five uh, results over here. We just kind of went from event types to um, the actual probability, and this is exactly what we see here. Uh, so the event types again are is the actual data, and the predict label is the uh, model. Um, you know, the, the, the actual labels that the model has predicted once we've trained it. Um, you can see that here they basically correspond um, and uh, we have, you know, probability or confidence level of, of the model predicting those values. Um, and here, uh, as you can see, the model actually predicts that, yes, uh, this is highly uh, likely that there is a violation uh, and it does not match uh, in this specific um, case. So now let's evaluate the model and let's look at some matrix. Again, first, um, uh, first let's look at model accuracy. As you recall, um, you know, model accuracy is basically looking at where uh, the predicted uh, and the label do agree, uh, and we just divide it over the entire uh, data set. Uh, and in this case, the uh, model accuracy is 92%. So it looks like the model actually is high and it's a good model, but you have to keep in mind that the majority of, uh, of the input data set is that there is no violations. Um, and then so what this means is that even if our model performed poorly, we would still get high accuracy simply because most of the outputs are that there are no violations. So we should then take a look at some other matrix. Let's define our true positives and false positives. And we see true positives again is that you know, the predictive violation um, that we've predicted a violation and did occur, and the false positives that we've predicted a violation, uh, but it did not actually occur. So then the precision is the metrics that we're is the metrics that we're interested in, 
um, and the matrix over here is basically you know the true positives divided by uh, true positives and all false positives. And here we have 86%, 86% uh, indicating that um, if we're just interested in looking at the violations, that we have um, a pretty good overall performance. And sometimes this is the case where you're only interested in how good is the model in prediction violations. We don't care about no violations because majority are no violations, but how good is the model of actually predicting violations. And if we use that matrix uh, metric, uh, then this would be uh, a, a pretty good high level um, indicator of our model performance. However, if we used, uh, if we if we're interested in, uh, you know, both the uh, the positive and negative, or basically the, the violations, the no violations that we could use um, uh, and about the area under the ROC curve. And in this case, we only get 68%, which 68% indicates that it's a fairly poor uh, model performance overall. And again, this is something that you need to keep in mind that you know, depending on what it is that you're looking for. Uh, and knowing uh, ahead of time, you know, uh, the uh, input data um, distribution um, and what, how, whether the, uh, you know, the data set is balanced or unbalanced um, and the, matri the metrics that you're most interested in between, you know, uh, model accuracy to precision or the area under the curve, you know, you would have to decide what is it that you want to use for um, your actual um, criteria of evaluating how good the model is. Now the next step, of course, if you want to improve the model, is you could uh, look at you know eliminating some of the features because some of the uh, features are highly correlated. For example, uh, the hours driven and the miles driven are highly correlated, so you could simplify the model and move one of those features uh, and use, for example, just the hours driven uh, without losing um, uh, losing uh, you know uh, the the input features uh, information in your models. Um, and then you could take a look at, for example, normalizing some of this data. As you recall, some of this data um, is, uh, is, is, is not well uh, distributed and it's got, uh, and it goes from you know, zero miles to some 3,300 miles. So normalizing that data might help uh, improve the model performance. All right, so now that you've trained your model, what you want to do next is you want to actually save the model in the machine learning repository. So you could share it, um, you could test it, you could do all kinds of things with it. So uh, let's get our uh, libraries that we need for that. And uh, here we're going to specify where, uh, where the model will actually be um, saved to. So let's go ahead. You can preview that the actual model that we're saving is a PySpark machine learning model and type of a pipeline model. And uh, now let's make sure we have uh, all the metadata specified and save the actual model. Uh, so as you can see, the, now the model name that I'm saving this under is Tracking Demo Robert H. All right, and once the model is saved, let's go and print out the model properties. So again, this is a Spark Machine Learning Model 2.0. And uh, here's the reference to the actual model. Um, on the cluster itself, creation time, which is uh, very useful if we want to look at the, the you know when we train different models at different times. Uh, so we have all that reference information. All right. So the next step is to actually deploy and test the model. So I'll be using a, um, a UI over here to see how the model performs based on uh, you know the different uh, input data, uh, and this is some of the sample data that we'll use uh, to start with. So let me go to my model management. And uh, let me click on my tracking violation prediction model over here. And as you can see, what we have here, and this is, um, we'll refer back to this later, is we have an internal scoring uh, endpoint if we want to score via, you know, uh, via an API internally. And then, of course, this is where the model is available externally. But for this case, we're going to test this API over here. So let me use some of the input data. Is certified? No. Payment scheme it could be hours or miles. We're going to use miles here. Hours driven. So let's use the average seventy hours driven and about three thousand three hundred miles. Latitude, uh, say ninety five. Longitude thirty seven. Is foggy? No. Is rainy? No. Is windy? No. And let's see how this predicts. All right. So uh, in this case, it essentially predicts that no violation will occur. It's been almost ninety five percent confident in this case. So let's see what happens if we 
change some of the variables. As you recall, uh, foggy and rainy uh, are uh, highly uh, correlated to um, a violation occurring. So let's, for example, change is foggy to true and see what happens. As you can see now, uh, the confidence level is far less than no violation will occur. And still, the model would output no violation, but it's only 67% uh, confident uh, at this point. Let's see what happens if we change it to, it's also raining, so it's foggy and raining. At this point, it changes to a violation would likely occur. Uh, and it sort of switches around, and basically it's 66% confident now that a violation occur. And as you recall from the cross-correlation matrix, is when it is slightly um, correlated, positively correlated with a violation occurring. So let's see what happens with the model. And again, this, this intuition that we have, um, you know, basically just by looking at the data now confirms that, you know, it would correspond to how the model would perform. Now that we've uh, tested this with, in the UI, another important step in model perform is actually being able to use it in production. So let's see how a RESTful API call would behave. Uh, as you recall, I've showed you before, um, once you train the model, once you save the model, you actually get a uh, scoring endpoint. So in this case, this is a scoring endpoint. This is the unique ID for that model. So what we do is basically we use that, um, uh, you know, the, the IP over here and, and the uh, identity of the model. And, uh, and the next step is to actually uh, get a token. And this token is only for uh, 24 hours. I've already created this with an actual user and a password. So we have a uh, bearer token over here. And this is this long string over here um, that we can execute. So for example, here I've pasted this one, which uh, with the input fields um, uh, actually specified uh, and the uh, and the entire Barry token over here. Uh, so it's just a very long, long string, but it's uh, for RESTful APIs doesn't make that much of a difference. It's just a long call. So we can see now that the RESTful API actually does reply back. Uh, this is the uh, input data um, uh, that, that has been passed uh, into the actual RESTful call. What we get back is the actual prediction based on this data. So in this case, it predicts that uh, this is a normal behavior or that the no violation would occur. Um, and, uh, and here you have the probabilities or confidence levels corresponding to that data. Now, similarly, we can also take this uh, entire curl string and paste it into a uh, terminal window. So for example, here I've got a window open already. Uh, one thing you want to make sure is you want to remove that exclamation mark. So let's go ahead. And as you can see, this is the exact same output that we saw in the notebook. Uh, so that we verified that our RESTful API does actually work. Um, and, uh, and we'll use that information um, in, uh, in Apache Nightfire where we have the actual flow deployed uh, end to end. And of course, um, there's a step seven where you can actually um, monitor the model per performance. Once you actually deploy the model, you can schedule um, you know, evaluation of the, the model itself as you get new data to see whether the model performs um, with, uh, you know, with the expected uh, metric, for example, area under the IRC curve. Uh, whether that threshold has been uh, has been triggered or not, and if, if the model does look good, uh, you should have a positive performance of the actual model. So with that we finished um, a quick overview of this um, IoT tracking demo notebook in DSX. Next up, we'll take a look at how the entire flow uh, looks in Apache Nightfire.